All right, uh, thank you everyone for, uh, I know I'm standing literally between you and dinner. So I'm going to try and keep it uh, as brief and to the point as possible. My name is Prashant Bhattacharya. I was a PhD student at the Department of Information Systems and Analytics uh, in the US. And very recently moved to the Institute of High Consensus Performance Computing, which is particularly next door, uh, where I work on high performance social science, if I might put it that way. Uh, so we have a team uh, at IHPC where we work on understanding fundamental concepts of human behavior, particularly on digital platforms, through computational and experimental methods. And so I'm very delighted to have this opportunity today to talk to you all about uh, something that's very close to my own research on understanding causal processes, particularly in natural contexts. Again, very relevant to the theme of the workshop. Uh, all of you are interested in learning in different kinds of communities, be it academia or industry. And as you would have realized already, causal processes are, are essential in facilitating and, and promoting learning in many of these environments. All right, so I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to start this presentation by just bringing up a very interesting incident that happened right in the middle of my uh, graduate program, where uh, a couple of researchers at Princeton actually published a paper on archive titled, a uh, very harmless title, uh, Epidemiological Modeling of Online Social Network Dynamics. And now, generally, most people who don't read papers and just read the abstract and the conclusion would have missed the fun part. But then someone shared this on Reddit and it went viral. And what this paper really did was well, it tried to fit an SIR model, it's a very popular model of foundation, in case you've, you've done a little bit of work on that, to Google Trends data. And Google Trends publishes aggregate search query data. And they extrapolated beyond uh, 2014 up to 2020. And they, and they basically created bounds on what is the predicted Google search query for platforms like MySpace and Facebook into the future. And they actually showed that their model fits the data pretty well. And so far, it was pretty harmless and it flowed nicely. The problem started right in the final section, where they ended the paper with a not so modest declaration. And this was literally the last line of the paper, where they said that we, mod we applied the model to the Google data for search query. And by extrapolating the best fit model, we suggest that Facebook will undergo a rapid decline in the coming years, losing 80% of its peak user base between 2015 and 2017. Now, this didn't happen, all right, and actually quite the reverse. Facebook has been going on an upward trend. But then since this was shared on Reddit, it, 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 it became viral, and then it caught the eye of people at Facebook Data Science who thought this was a very interesting uh, case to talk about. And they actually got back. And the folks at Facebook Data Science replied with their own post. So they didn't write a paper. They had one day. So they did some analysis and they wrote a post on Facebook, one of their data scientists. And they used the number of page likes on Facebook for different universities to show that the page likes for Princeton has actually been declining over the past few years. And they actually followed it up with another analysis where they looked at the number of times Princeton has been named in Google Scholar articles. And they found that Princeton has actually peaked around 2000, and now it's on down the trend. And so they were pretty uh, clear about their conclusion. They said, in keeping with the scientific principle, correlation equals causation, our research unequivocally demonstrated that Princeton may be in danger of disappearing entirely. And then they doubled down, and then they actually showed that Google search trends, the same data source that Princeton used, correlated with student enrollment. Um, so the higher the number of students, uh, the more the search terms on Google Trends. Uh, and they had a quite decent R square of 0.54. And then they showed that Google Trend queries for Princeton were on a downward trend which probably meant that Princeton would only have half of its current enrollment by 2018. And by 2021, it would have no students at all. 
agreeing with the previous graph of scholarly scholarliness, right? And they ended the post with pretty much a slam dunk, where they plotted the Google Trend queries for the word air. And they found that the search trends for the word air was also on a downward spiral. And this was the conclusion from the post. They said, while we're concerned for Princeton, we are even more concerned about the fate of the planet. Uh, Google trends for air have also been declining steadily, and our projections show that by 2060, there would be no air left. Um, so this was a fun kind of to and fro between uh, two new institutions, but it really brought back the age-old debate between association and causation. And generally, I, I don't prefer to call it correlation because it has a nasty linear linearity assumption attached to it. So I'm going to call it association and, and causation for now. Um, so for those of you who probably uh, walked in the final day of the workshop and having attended the previous sessions, um, association is really the change in outcome of a particular variable that you observe when a certain factor x changes. So if you if you in Singapore, it's, you know there are two two uh, uh, types of weather here. It's either warm or it's raining. And whenever it rains, you see people with umbrellas. So you know the sightings of umbrellas is strongly correlated with rain. But then you can think of it in terms of causation, where if you change a particular variable, so you, you intervene on a particular variable, some other variable changes, right? So you think of a hypothetical situation where if you open an umbrella, for some mysterious reason, it starts raining. And you can make a case for a causation, right? So uh, there's been a lot of confusion about what is correlation, and more interestingly, what isn't correlation. So I thought of having one slide, which I literally stole from uh, the link over there. So we generally say x and y, two variables, are associated if knowing x provides some information for y. Now, if you can think of information in any information theoretic sense. Um, in, other, in other terms, you, if you observe the value of x, it somehow changes the conditional distribution of y. So the probability of y conditioning x is not the same or the same as the probability of y. This is, the, this is a slightly more nuanced definition of association. Um, a third way of thinking about it is, is if you know x, it helps predict y better. And finally, if you're coming from the more Bayesian or more probabilistic background, if you observe x, it changes your belief about the distribution of y. These are all different ways of saying x is associated with y. Now, what isn't association is if for some reason you manipulate or disturb or intervene in x, and that changes the distribution of y. That's when you enter into the realm of causation. Now, what's interesting, of course, is that causation doesn't imply correlation or at least linear correlation either. So if you look at all these different correlational plots, especially the one uh, in, in the last row, you will see that these are all examples of causation. But if you plot, if you do a linear correlation, if you find a linear cor correlation coefficient, they're probably very close to zero. But these are again valid examples of causation, right? And this is again another another example of why I prefer to use the term uh, association and not not correlation, uh, unless it's very clear. So one question that, that I keep thinking about is why is humans why do, why are humans so bad at you know disentangling correlation or causation? Um, and there are really multiple reasons for that. So one good reason for for why we're really bad at this is this experiment right over there. So I'm going to show you a short, like, 10-second clip. And I'm going to ask you about what you just saw, all right? So this was actually. Uh, a series of experiments that was done in the 1940s where people were shown such kind of video clips and asked, what did you just see? And for the first part of the video, a lot of most people answered that, oh, we, we saw a big red ball uh, come and hit a smaller ball, and then the smaller ball bounced off in a different direction. 
And this is clearly a very causal interpretation of what was simply two circles programmed to move at different time points. Right? So what Albert Mishot in the 1940s really pointed out uh, was that humans like to see causality. We, we see causality in the way we see color. When we see patterns, we naturally draw causal conclusions without really thinking about do we have enough evidence to suggest that there's causality in play, not correlation. Well, the second example, of course, is about confirmation bias. And sometimes we just assume things to be correct because we think it's correct. Right. Here's a good example. But this was a news article that I, I read a couple of uh, a year back, actually, which said children who eat breakfast before school are twice as likely to perform well in tests. Now, you know, you, you don't need to be an experimental researcher to sort of have a gut feeling that this is correct. Because having breakfast is good. This is confirmation bias in play. There was another study more recently that said Harry Potter readers are more likely to dislike Donald Trump. And you have no idea, and you have to read the article, you have no idea how this experiment was, I mean, this is not even an experiment actually, just a survey, but you still have a gut feeling that, yeah, I think this is correct. And so people generally draw conclusions that are causal in nature, uh, even though it might have nothing to do with causation. And finally, there is, of course, this attribution bias. We do not think about hidden factors, which play a big role in estimating causal uh, inference. All right, so think about elections and when you actually go to vote. Generally, you want to think that the process that influences people to go out and vote would look like this. So you look at candidate choices, you analyze pros and cons, and then you make an informed decision, and then on the day of the election, you go out and vote. But in reality, the process might be somewhat like this. You have this whole bunch of factors that influence your decision at various levels Till, uh, up until the day you actually go out and vote. Um, so there are a lot of these hidden factors that influence our, our behavior in, in, in different stages. So there are a couple of uh, myths surrounding <laughs> correlation and causation. So for instance, correlation implies causation unless proven otherwise, but that's not true. Correlation is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for showing causation. The other myth that you Hear about quite, quite commonly is that we can cover causation using observational data. So I give you a bunch of data and I tell you, hey, can you cover causation? Uh, you, you probably won't be able to do it unless in very specialized contexts. So I know in a previous talk, uh, Chuan spoke about identification strategies. Uh, so you have these quasi experimental settings as well, where you can identify causation. Uh, correlation implies causation when the correlation is statistically that's just wrong. That's not true. Statistical significance means entirely different things. And finally, and particularly the way we think about regressions leads us to believe that you can test causation by running regression models. And again, that's not true unless your data itself is generated under some high experimental controls. So here's a causation checklist, and I call it a checklist because irrespective of what field you're coming from, if you're doing causal research, you would have to check for these three essential conditions before which before you can actually claim uh, causal inferences. So the first one being association. So there needs to be significant association between cause and effect. Uh, the second being temporal precedence, which means the cause has to precede the effect. And the third and the most important and probably the hardest to prove is isolation. Which means that no other external factor must influence either the cause or the effect or both. Right, so let me give you uh, a simple example using uh, a, a recent question that's very uh, high interest to me. Does grad school make you rich? All right. Uh, so here you have a predictor, which is grad school training, and you have an outcome variable, which is your rate. And you want to draw causal inferences in this kind of situation. So, in the ideal cases, what you want to have is a single independent and a single dependent variable. Uh, this is the worst case, where you literally don't have any link between.
between grad school and well, but you have a common unobserved factor, which might be mental ability in this case, that's influencing both the cause and the effect, giving the illusion of causation. But in most cases, it's not that bad or that good. So you have something in the middle where you do have a link between grad school and salary, but then there's also a hidden factor that biases your estimates. Right. So how do you take care of the situation? Uh, when we use what's called uh, the idea of randomization and counterfactuals, again, very simply put, if I want to find out if every year of grad school helps you get a higher salary when you leave grad school, I would want someone who would basically be exactly like you, but outside grad school. And then I would compare the two of you after five years and see who earns a higher salary. Right? So that's the other person is what's called a counterfactual. Someone who's exactly like you, but doesn't exist. So again, a little bit of math. So the treatment effect for any person high would be the difference between the two outcomes, the outcomes being salary. Of the person high, when he or she is treated, minus the same outcome when he or she is not treated. So if you think about education on salary, it's salary for a person high when the person is given grad school education minus when the person is not given grad school education. And this is the big problem of estimating causation. Uh, the, the person I cannot be educated and not educated at the same time. Right? You can think of a parallel universe where the person exists without education but not in the same universe. So how do you do this? So randomization solves this problem. Right? So what you do is you construct two groups. Uh, you randomly pick two samples from your population and randomly assign people to one of, one of, one of these two groups. So you treat one group and keep the other group constant in the control group. And then there are, of course, hairy problems about whether it's even, can you, can you force someone to go to grad school? So how would you, how would you assign treatment in, in this kind of case? But <laughs> assuming you had your dictator and you decide who goes to grad school and who doesn't, you would probably run this experiment in, in, in an ideal situation. And then the difference in salary outcomes outside grad school would be your, what's called the average treatment effect. For, for this context. So again, so you, you, you essentially do a randomized controlled trial on, on the grad school, you, you randomize grad school entry for a certain sample of users. So what this does essentially is it breaks the link between your unobserved factor and your main predictor. And so experimentation actually has a rich history. I won't get into that. I just wanted to point out that it traces back not just to Ronald Fisher, uh, who's popularly attributed with being the father of randomized experimentation, but actually right back to the 6th century BC, in, in a biblical tale where there was a king who, who, who split his countrymen into two groups. To one group he said, go drink wine. To the other he said, go drink water. And then after a few weeks, he wanted to see which group was happier. And Based on that result, he wanted to make that a universal law for all on human beings. That was probably like the first example of uh, treatment control kind of a setting, although the, although the groups were not randomized. And then there are multiple uh, examples over the years, over the centuries rather. The most recent one and the most famous one being the famous streptomycin trial in 1946 and published in 1948. Uh, and as I think some of you would know, streptomycin is popularly used as a cure for tuberculosis. And they did a randomized, blind, double blind, uh, placebo controlled trial to actually estimate whether it really works or not. Right. But then RCTs have its own limitations. And that's sort of where we go to the more interesting parts of the whole causation debate. So, first of all, you might run into ethical dilemmas. Like, think about the effect of education on salary. Uh, is it fair to design an experiment where some people do not get education? Can you systematically deny some people from getting education? Um, so you can think of contexts where some people get denied by chance, which would be very opportunistic, but otherwise you, 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 you could never get IRB approval if you wanted to design an experiment like that. Uh, the most famous debate was, does smoking lead to cancer? And then Ronald Fisher actually spoke out against uh, uh, 
popular studies that were correlating smoking with cancer based on this observational data. But then again, I mean, can you assign people to smoking? So here, assigning to the treatment groups on it, right? Can you force people to smoke? But more importantly, there might be theoretical challenges. So can you randomize a dyadic or a network level? So, so far, we've been talking about individual level causation problems. But what about studying causation at a dyad or at a network level? And that's a whole different uh, complexity altogether. But so far, uh, I just gave you a primer on how intervening on a particular predictor, we call it X, leads to a change in outcome Y for the same individual I. Right? But what happens when you want to give treatment or give an intervention to a different person, maybe your peer, and you want to study the effect of that on your own outcome, your own behavior? And such peer level causal processes are everywhere, you know, in education but also in pretty much every other behavior context you can think of. So you think of adoption of brands or, or services, diffusion of innovations, spread of disorders like obesity, smoking, alcoholism, voting behavior, whether your voting preference influences your peers, and finally content consumption. So what you consume on social media influences what your peers consume. So peer influence is so central in social science research that there's actually a sort of inside joke in the social science influence community that there are really three kinds of social science researchers. Uh, the first, people whose research directly focuses on peer influence. The second, people whose research focuses on social influence, but they generally choose to ignore it. And the third are people whose research focuses on social influence, but they just don't know it yet. Um, but then again, peer influence is very tricky and a non-trivial thing to study because it's almost always confounded with what's called homophily. And again, homophily, if you've heard the word homophily, you also heard the, the very common definition that birds are trying to come together. Right? So that's the general definition of homophily. And what it probably means is when you observe users in a pair, you would notice that their behaviors are correlated as compared to two other randomly selected individuals. So if you think of your best friend or your, your spouse or your, your partner, you, all, you might share similar behaviors in many aspects. So here's a hypothetical story that's picked from um, one of my least favorite papers. Not because the paper is bad, the paper is actually pretty good. Uh, but I hate this paper because now the reviewers have something they can cite when they reject my papers. Um, so the, the story goes like this. Suppose there are two friends named Ian and Joey. And Ian's parents ask him, if your friend Joey jumped up a bridge, would you jump too? And the question is, why might Ian answer yes? So the authors say that there are at least six reasons. So the first example is that Joey's example inspired Ian, which is social contagion. Okay? And this is what you would ideally want to see if you're studying pure influence. Now, the second example is Joy infected Ian with a parasite that somehow suppresses the fear of falling on bridges. And this is biologically contagion. Right? It's still contagion, but not social. The third one is the Joy and Ian are friends on account of their shared fondness for jumping off bridges. So, this is homophily based on the focal behavior, which is jumping off bridges. So, they both like jumping on bridges and they both know. The fourth reason could be that they met through what's called a thrill-seeking club, whose membership roles are publicly available. So I can look at the membership records of the club, and I know that these two people are lifetime members. And so they are prone to doing membership uh, club activities like jumping on bridges. Right? And so this is homophily, but on a secondary behavior. The fifth example could be the joy and Ian became friends because of their shared fondness for roller coasters. So again, they met a theme park because they have this inner drive for thrill seeking. And now this is what's called latent homophily. Because you don't really see the inner drive, but this is what's really uh, influencing their outward behavior. And the last one is that they both jump off the bridge because maybe they both realize independently that different 
points in time that the bridge is going to collapse and they're, they're going to die, and they feel that jumping off earlier might be a safer option. So this is more of a shared external context that forces both of them to adopt a particular behavior, but this is neither homophily nor right. So There are at least six explanations for observing correlated behavior in diets. And this is problematic if you're a researcher studying peer influence. Because how do you disentangle influence from all these other five factors? So proving existence of homophily influence is fairly easy. If you, if, you have, if you did an experiment or you had observational data, there are good methods for doing this. Quantifying homophily influence is, is tough, but I would make the case that you could do this under special context. This is just feasible. Now, what's particularly difficult to do is isolating the effect of influence or homophily uh, from each other, from other explanations. So isolation is really tough in this context. And so Silesia and Thomas published a really amazing paper in 2011 from where I actually took the story that says homophily and contagion are generically confounded in observational social network study. Do you see how they don't mix their words? So it's, 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 it's a great paper if you're looking at studying peer influence and observational studies. So you could do experiments, so you could do randomized controlled trials to, to do a little bit of that. And I want to cite this example from a paper I took from, uh, uh, it's, uh, this, this is a, a study done uh, by this research at Facebook, there's Adrian and Bakshi and Dean Eccles, uh, who wanted to look at the effect of targeting people on Facebook with social ads. And if, you've, if you're not familiar with social ads on Facebook, they look something like this. So this was from the early days of Facebook, where ads were much cleaner. Now the social ads on Facebook have you know, a lot more social to them. But you, know, you have these two icons of the pages, and then on the one on the, on the left hand side, you just have the generic information on how many people like that page. And then on the, on the right, you have a social cue. So it tells you that one, one of your friends have liked this page in addition to generic other people. And so Facebook would target these ads to people with at least one other person in their network who have like who's like this page, right? So now what you what's really cool about this study is it doesn't really manipulate the peers by assigning behaviors. It just manipulates the signal from the peers. Um, and the other cool thing is the two conditions look exactly the same. If you look at the pixels. It's just the same amount of white and gray pixels. It's just that there, there's the name mentioned in one and a number mentioned in the other. And so in the first condition, they don't they don't mention any social cue. In the second condition, they mention one social cue. And what they want to do is they want to estimate what's called the marginal peer effect. So what's the effect of showing one additional person's information to you? And how does that affect your probability of liking the app? Right. So they have they have these three conditions. So in the first condition, they show an ad with one of your friends mentioned, and the other you have two of your friends, and the third one, three of your friends. So this is what they found. Right. In the first condition, um, so so the variable z tells you how many of your friends have actually liked the page. So you have three conditions where one, two, and three of your friends have liked the page. And the x-axis here are the number of cues that are presented to the focal user. So how many users are you showing to the person, the subject? Now you see the three control conditions are quite different. So in all the three conditions, the number of cues shown was zero. So you don't see any social cue. But then in the three conditions, the difference is you have different number of friends who have liked that page. And the researchers see that there is this difference in the like rate for the focal user, which probably means that if you have more people in your network liking the page, there's a natural tendency that you would eventually like the page. And this is homophily in action, right? So that the larger the number of people in your neighborhood who like the page, the higher the probability that you would have liked the page as well. So in absence of any treatment, there's a natural increase 
lightweight across the treatment protocols. But what's more interesting is when you now show a cue in the three conditions, you see a lift from the control condition. So given that there is at least one person in your neighborhood who has liked the page, if I now display that cue to the focal user, you see a higher lift you know, over the control condition. And so this is influence. So I really like this study because using this one study, the researchers demonstrated how you could quantify homophily and influence in a pretty nice online setting. And they actually moved from zero to one, uh, and they showed that this is actually pretty elastic. So you, you increase the number of cues from one to two to three, and the, the, the treatment effect increases uh, right. <laughs> But then there are multiple challenges to doing this kind of work. So how do you sample individual users during randomization? So how do you pick users to randomize? Now you can think about a case where you want to implement a, a video chat application. Right? So Facebook introduced the video chat uh, a while back. And if you have to randomly pick individuals to assign um, the video chat option, you might end up with a case where a person has been treated with a video chat, but none of the person's peers have video chats. Who's the person chatting with? Right? So randomization it might be tricky in certain contexts. Now, conventional A-B tests in networks, uh, like the one I just explained, are almost always vulnerable to what's called network interference. And just to give you an example of what network interference is, I'll give you a, I'll tell you a short story of what I've been working with. So I came to work this morning and I realized that one of the Wi-Fi access points was down. So we used three wireless access points in our office, and we pretty much randomly connect any one of the three, depending on you know, which one's faster on that day. And out of the three, one went down for some time this morning. So all the people who were affected were, could not connect to the internet. So they just stood up and looked around to see if everyone else was affected. And you would imagine that all the other people with still working access points, would continue working on their stuff. But very soon, I found that everyone in the office was just loitering around because people who did not get connected to the internet went around to other people's cubicles, talking to them, and they basically disrupted everyone. So, this is a perfect example of uh, indirect network interference where someone else's treatment influences your own outcome, even though you don't get the treatment. And so this is very common in conventional randomized experiments, especially in the way. And finally, and this is particularly uh, a difficult problem to solve. So when you do a treatment control split on networks, how do you make sure that the two groups have a similar network topology? Uh, because we randomly pick elements into two groups. So you have no way of ensuring that uh, the two, two groups would have the same network structure. So there is uh, one way to get around this. So again, you just think about the network interference problem. Uh, you think about the big Facebook network. You could do a randomized experiment where you pick each node, toss a coin, and then if it's head, you attribute it to treatment. If it's tails, you attribute it to, you, know, you assign it to the control group. But then if it's a video chat application, and if you're someone like this, who's surrounded by people who did not get treated, then you're pretty, then you're pretty much stuck, and you have no way to use that application. So it's a wasted experiment. So in the ideal case, to do this experiment, you would want a parallel universe, where everyone in your universe is treated, and then everyone in the same universe is also not treated at the same time. But as you know, parallel universes don't exist, or at least don't exist in the social networks discourse. Um, so you'd have to think of something interesting. So one very interesting solution that tech companies sort of have zeroed on is what's called the New Zealand option. And if you might have noticed, uh, Facebook particularly introduces all its new features in New Zealand first. So it introduced the timeline, it introduced uh, an online marketplace. For some time, it even introduced disappearing messages. So if you really want to, and it's not just with Facebook, Booking.com, Skype, Twitter, they all introduce their features in New Zealand first. So if you're interested in, in, you know, in knowing about the future of the web, you should probably go to New Zealand. Uh, and the reason they do, about, they do this is, so here's, here's Facebook's 
director of product, Adam Busseri, he even introduced the economist, but he actually openly gave the explanation that it's, it's because it's a smaller country, it has just the right size to have sufficient uh, statistical power, but they also found through their own internal analysis that people in New Zealand don't tend to talk to people outside New Zealand a lot. And that's that's really perfect if you're doing graph partitioning because it creates a very natural graph partition. It's New Zealand becomes a treatment group and the rest of the world becomes the control group. But then if you would have realized already, it's problematic because now you just have two groups. And then one could argue that the curious have uh, their own idiosyncrasies in many other ways. It makes it harder to draw generalizable inferences. So how do you get around this problem? So one solution to this problem, which is used in this literally the state of the art now, is in doing what's called graph cluster randomization, where you essentially come up with a way of cutting through your network using a number of different kinds of algorithms, such that one side becomes a treatment group, the other side becomes a control group. Now, there are multiple ways of doing this. So you can think of natural partitions. So at a country level, you can think of Singapore being a treatment group and Hong Kong being a control group. Or if you're within the United States, you could like cut along the Mississippi and then East Coast becomes treatment and West Coast becomes control. But then the problem uh, with doing uh, you know, a natural partition of networks is you're still ending up with two groups, which is not enough, especially if you're looking for statistical power. So then you're, you, you come up with more scalable and other kinds of graph cutting methods uh, using community detection. There are community detection algorithms that are scalable, and you can come up with different communities. Uh, you have labeled propagation algorithms to create these clusters. And so there was a recent study by uh, researchers at Facebook, Facebook where they could actually come up with 6,400 clusters by just cutting the English Facebook population within the United States. Uh, so there, there are multiple ways. And then you could, once you have the clusters, then you can randomize at a cluster level. So you can pick a cluster with a probability uh, P and then assign it to treatment around, right? treatment or control. All right, so if you're not as lucky and if you don't have the privilege of uh, working with a large scale data, you probably not be able to do cluster randomization and you'd have to depend on observational approaches. Um, so there have been some studies that, that look at uh, how to use observational data for performing these analysis. So one method could be of using propensity scores, very simply put. They try to model individual probabilities and getting treated and being the control. And based on that, you could actually decide who gets treated and who doesn't, and then model the own refraction accordingly. Uh, for those of you who work on AI and come from the probabilistic uh, kind of modeling background, you're more familiar with the graphical approaches to doing this. And the third one, probably one of my own favorites, is working with random graph models or variants of random graph models that are sort of in between the more social science approaches of doing you know, propensity scores of instrumental variables on one side, which require a lot of data, and uh, the Bayesian or graphical approaches on the other side, uh, which are more assumption intensive. And these sort of sit somewhere in the middle. So a lot of these observational methods are, are good in the sense that they relax the, di the dyadic independence assumptions, but they're very assumption intensive depending on what context you work in. So you could have assumptions on latent variables, uh, reverse causality, etc. And so if you have these kind of concerns in your data context, you probably have to think about better ways to deal with this problem. So one nice way of uh, studying causality on networks, especially using observational approaches, is to depend on natural experiments, where for some reason the manipulation has already been done for you. And the groups have been assigned to treatment or control groups almost as if at random. So you can think about natural disasters, right? So Toronto's paper on modeling uh, uh, how natural disasters, particularly hurricanes, influence uh, individual uh, friendship formation across uh, different, uh, different cities in, in the United States. You can look at migration patterns. This is a natural way of creating clusters. And this, of course, the, migration, the reason for migration is somehow related to your outcome. 
but then it can treat it as an exogenous shock. You can also think about group assignments. There have been studies in social science where people have been assigned to different groups uh, for different reasons. You know, students get assigned to uh, different dorms where they have different uh, dorm mates, and that's a natural source of group assignment. So you can exploit these natural treatments and natural controls to come up with different uh, inferences about causality. Right, so I just want to take uh, a minute more to plug something that I'm working on uh, uh, currently. And so in this study, what we're looking at is understanding how what your peers do in terms of content production on a really large social network site influences your own content production. So it's, it's in a very simple formulation of the problem. You think of these blue nodes as your peers who are producing a lot of content on social media. How does that influence what you produce on the platform? So if your peers are producing more, does that encourage you or influence you to produce more? Or vice versa, do you be overloaded with all the content and you reduce your content production? And this is a particularly challenging empirical problem because social media posts are a really fast changing behavior. So if you're, if you're, if you're modeling behavior like uh, smoking or alcoholism, these are slow moving behaviors. People don't fall in and out of smoking every other day. But social media posts is a fast changing behavior. If you have a lot of time on your hands, you could be tweeting very actively every day. Right? Uh, when you have exams or you're reviewing a paper, you probably be out of Twitter for a whole week or over two weeks and have a stretch. Uh, and the link formation, of course, is endogenous. So we can't treat the links as given. So how do you model a situation where you are forming friends based on unobserved monopoly, but then those friends in turn influence what you're doing? So it's kind of a, a reverse causality at play here. And finally, you can't do a randomized trial in this kind of context because assigning treatments to behavior to your peers is neither realistic nor useful. It's not realistic because you can't really call up people and say, hey, can you post uh, 10 pieces of content today because I want to see what happens to your friends. And it's not useful because uh, even if you do that, there's no way of guaranteeing that that information percolates to the focal user. So as a user, I might have no idea that my peers are posting content because of the ranking algorithm of the platform and the newsfeed algorithm, etc. So the way to go around this is we have a nice stochastic modeling framework where we use a combination of simulation and observed data. So we have observed data on a complete network of a particular cohort of students from a major American university who we track through a one year, one year period. And we have network data at fixed timestamps about the complete network. So think about 12 months data where we know the network at each month. And we use the random graph modeling approach to basically simulate micro steps from one month to the other. And we generate millions and millions of these networks to the, to the point where the simulated network matches the observed network at the next time period. And we, we using this strategy, we're able to back out parameters of influence and, and model. So the two questions that we really answered through this modeling approach is how frequent do you simulate these uh, hypothetical counterfactual networks? And the other question is, on what basis do you decide which link to form or to break? And so we have an empirical strategy that addresses all these problems. And just to give you a summary of the results, we actually find no observable homophily based on usual traits. So we don't find that people are into, people form friends based on age or gender, which is a pretty, which is pretty interesting for us to learn because normally we would imagine that students form friendships based on similar uh, demographics. But then what we found was that there was homophily based on posting behavior. So people made friends with others who had similar levels of social media postings, which was pretty interesting for us to learn. But what was even more interesting and intriguing was that once they became friends, over time, they diverged in their posting behavior from their peers. And we feel, we feel that this is consistent with a lot of work in social psychology in recent years that talk about how people have this innate desire 
to craft their own images on social media, and they want to look different from their peers. So they diverge from their peers in their social media content production profile. So this is still early work. We're, we're kind of revising the model, and uh, we're trying to see what are the interesting insights that we can find from the student network data. Right. So the final slide I have for you today is to take you a step further. So I want to like push you to the edge of the cliff and just like, keep you there. Um, and I want to close this with a question. So so far, we've looked at how individual factors affect individual outcomes, and we've also looked at how peer interventions affect an individual's outcome. And now I want to ask you the more kind of advanced question of do network topologies matter? And more importantly, what happens if the network structure is not completely observed? So just to give an example, so you have the focal user, which is the green node, and you have the same number of peers who are posting the same numbers, you know, same pieces of content, but now in one network you have more cycles, in the other network you do not have cycles. So would these two networks differ in the extent of peer inputs? Um, and this is an open question, there are different ways by which you can do it. And what about incompletely observed networks? So in the third network, so the dotted lines uh, indicate incomplete information. So here we know that there exists two other nodes and three other links, but we don't know the nature of the nodes or the nature of the links. The way there's missing attributes. So in these incomplete data contexts, can you infer, can you have a more, can you have an unbiased and efficient way of coming up with peer inputs? Uh, which is an open problem now. So if you want to do more uh, research in this direction, I think this would be a very fruitful area. So concluding thoughts, uh, I think I'm on time. And uh, right before you run off for dinner, um, so part of ending the talk with showing your cash photos, just to give you the positive after, after thought. Finding associations is easy. You know, it's, this is a solved problem. If you have a lot of data, you can probably find out correlations from the data, uh, which might be insightful, but then not very impactful when it comes to policy decisions. This is an easy test. You can, all of us can do that. Attributing causation is hard. Right? So going a step further and thinking about how can you turn those correlations into policy decisions involves making causal decisions, and this is hard. Attributing causation on networks is even harder. And this is sort of you're going down the complexity one. So if you want to think about peer influences on networks, this is particularly hard. And finally, doing causation on networks using observational data and using coming up with unbiased and scalable estimators is really, really hard. And uh, if you're in the in a graduate program in the middle of your PhD, uh, this is probably not a good time to start thinking of these problems. You get your PhD and then you can probably uh, uh, pivot into doing some of these uh, pieces of research. Uh, all right, so thank you very much. That's all really what I had for you today. Uh, if you're interested in networks or any kind of uh, causal processes in education or otherwise, uh, I'd be super excited to talk to you about it. Thank you very much for being wonderful. Yes, thank So, um, if you go back to this slide where you were talking about all, all the different kinds of homophily, homophily, I was wondering about a different case, whether it fits under this or whether it could be called something different. Um, so, uh, in sociolinguistics, we think about how it is that um, there's, uh, there's both an in-group uh, pressure to behave like the people we're with, which I guess is kind of the opposite of trying to distinguish yourself from those people. But sometimes groups have relationships with each other, and your group might set itself apart from some other group. So if you observe somebody in the corresponding group doing something, you might do something different because you want to be different from that other group. Yes. So that means that two people who are part of the same group might both observe people from a different group. And they're actually being influenced by the people in the other group, but they're being influenced similarly because they're part of the same group. It seems like it's adding a layer of structure on this that I'm not seeing 
which is about these processes being mediated through uh, identity processes. So I'm wondering, what do you think about that? Does it fit under these, or is it a different one? I, I it's, it's just a, I'm just curious how you would treat that kind yeah, of. Correct. Yeah. So I, I do remember it's different. They have described it about people running features at different universities, and uh, this brand signaling uh, goes on about uh, whether I associate myself with a particular university or the other. Um, so I guess the point here being that there are multiple processes that can be played at the same time. So you could be uh, influenced by a common external factor, but at the same time, you also influence and observe the you, uh, which is that you're both part of part of the same university, um, which makes it even more uh, appealing to have a more controlled setting where you can systematically omit one process and try to measure the other. But then again, you trade off on realism because how realistic does that experiment look? Um, so I guess it's it's hard to um, do peer influence when you have these multiple processes simultaneously at play, um, which limits the kind of questions that you can ask. I guess, yeah, yeah, there's some easy answer to that. Yeah, because I guess from my standpoint, so it sounds like from the way that you're characterizing your answer that you're not thinking of it as having this additional layer of this identity layer, uh, which is a little bit different. Because the homophily I thought was really just that. We behave similarly because we have characteristics in common, right. but not because we identify with the same thing. Oh, Unless sure, you yeah. consider that identification to be a characteristic right. that we share, right? Because it sounds like you're saying, well, it's just that there are these multiple processes going right. on, right. which is another way of looking at it. But yeah. I guess it's, it's, so I think this comes from, I mean, probably comes from the more uh, sociology side of things where they differentiate between observed and unobserved of the problem, mm -hmm. where they actually use all your inner tendencies and traits to unobserved monthly, and they may observe signals of identity to uh, observe monthly. Oh, okay. Right. So okay. It's, it's different ways of, I guess, depending on the community that you're interested in. I think our process is actually very awkward. It is uh, people who are maybe similar to behave possibly the opposite, or people who behave opposite behaving similarly. So I think that um, some of the modeling things are just really on the kind of you know, edge. Correct. Yeah, I think the big frustration with the pure influence uh, in literature is that it's very heavy context specific. So you can't really have a grand theory of pure influence that exists and it's positive for certain kinds of behaviors. Uh, it's super context specific, depends on the population you're studying and what time period you're using. Okay, so um, you, you are talking about some graph clustering algorithm that you apply to uh, find out um, partitions in the data which you can use for control and data groups. So, did you consider the influence of the algorithms? Some of the other things and that might affect what you're trying to measure. Yeah, that, yeah. So that's a great question. So um, a lot of these your glass graph clustering algorithm itself would impact the bias and variance of your treatment effect. Um, and so you think of if you look at the, the, the two different clusters that you got here, I think it's a good point. So we're gonna talk about it now. So we're here, I mean you could if you look at some of the the nodes right, right on the edges, right? So they would be completely surrounded by people who are treated or, or not treated, right? The ones right on the edges, like the needle nodes, right? Uh, and if you base your inferences based you know, on those individuals, you get a very biased estimate of your treatment because you're overweighting the nodes with a lower degree. Okay? So then you can probabilistically correct or adjust for this effect by having some measure of what's called neighborhood exposure. So this every cluster in the garden will lead to a different distribution of neighborhood exposures for different modes. And so you could you could correct or adjust for that that will like reduce the bias and variance. Okay, uh, that's my question. Yeah.